Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. So inshallah ta'ala, this will just be our, our, our uh, last session inshallah ta'ala. We'll finish within an hour and then we'll have a lot of time for Q&A inshallah. I know that there will be a lot of questions um, about the subject. Now we go into the fiqh of it, okay? And I told you all that when we go into the jurisprudence of it, that number one, there, there was a reason why I chose the story of Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be the last uh, story that we would cover when covering the virtues. Because that's the one that has legal implications. And it was very important to understand that the legalities were all that changed with Zayd, but nothing changed in regards to the Prophet وسلم, treating him with the love of a son and treating Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu's child as his own uh, grandson. A few things to introduce the subject of fiqh of kafala. Number one, it is mainly when you're talking about kafala and you're talking about adoption and things of that sort, it's an issue of semantics, it's an issue of culture, it's an issue of terms and context. A lot of times people get caught up with the names of things and with the terms. So for example, immediately we falsely equate tabanni with adoption. Tabanni, which is what was forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we equate it with adoption. We say, well, isn't adoption haram? I think that if anyone looks at everything we've covered thus far in this class, it sounds quite ridiculous to say something like that. It really, really does, because it really counters everything that our religion stands for. There are a few things from the perspective on the technical ban on adoption with Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and adoption again, tabanni in that sense, to, to, it's, it's not the, the perfect um, equating of terms. When it came to Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Zayd was also over the age of puberty. And we said this, that yatim in Islam is up until the age of bulugh, up until the age of puberty. So even afterwards, there was no way for him to be considered an orphan in that sense anyway. Zayd was already a grown man. He was married. He was very active in his society and multiple fronts and things of that sort. So he would not have been considered an orphan at that point um, anyway. Now, one of the things that we always have to balance <clears throat> is that we always look to the objectives of the law and the technicalities. And we should not allow the technicalities to override the objectives, nor should we try to use the objectives to negate the technicalities, but instead you have to find that perfect harmony, that marriage between the two. There are legal restrictions and rituals and things of that sort, but you don't negate the purpose of the Sharia. There's a reason why we have maqas the Sharia, the technicalities and the universal. So you have to try to find um, that balance between the two. And that is very complicated with this subject in particular. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow what I say to be truth and to uh, allow us to avoid uh, falsehood or speaking uh, without knowledge or out of place. So one of the technical, one of the, the, the principles of Islamic law, one of the maqasid is hifdul nasir or al ird They're either two separate maqasid or they're one, which is to preserve lineage or to preserve honor. I consider them to be two separate kulliyat, two separate universals in fact. But the preservation of nasr, the preservation of lineage, is a very, very important part um, of our sharia. And it's one of the maqasid, it's one of the universals. It saves society from a lot of problems. Okay, it's, it's something that, that, you know, obviously though it's an exception, it's not the norm. You end up, because you don't preserve lineage, with very complicated situations at times. You do have brothers that end up marrying their sisters unknowingly and things of that sort. That type of stuff does happen. And there are numerous reasons why the preservation of lineage is one of the maqasid of sharia. So the first question that comes up usually when you're talking about adoption is the idea of naming a child. Does the child have to be named after their father, their biological parents, or can they be named um, after you? So we're talking about naming. Now there are a few things to keep in mind here. Calling someone dad or mom that's not dad or mom as a means of ascribing yourself to them biologically is haram. So calling someone mom or dad in a way that you ascribe yourself to them with lineage is haram. And it's, in fact, it's very, very much uh, so warned against. The Prophet ﷺ said that the one who knowingly um, attributes himself or calls someone other than his father uh, calls himself after that person, he's committed a form of kufr. Kufr here is not the ultimate kufr, it's a form of ingratitude. Okay, it's a form of great ingratitude. 
and whoever claims to belong to a people that he has no ties to of blood, فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقَعْدَهُ بِالنَّارِ Let him choose his place in hellfire. So it's very serious. Context. Okay? In our Sharia, this is so serious that even if you have a child that doesn't know who their father is, you would give them a generic last name, you know, the son of Abdullah, the son of Muhammad, so that they don't end up falsely being ascribed to a, a person. Why is that context there? In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, in that tribalistic society, people who were embarrassed by their status or embarrassed by their parents would lie and ascribe themselves to other people. It was very common to say that you belong to a tribe that you didn't belong to, to say that someone was your dad that wasn't your dad, to say someone was your mom that wasn't your mom. The idea was to get by in a society that values people once again only in accordance with their lineage, only in accordance with their tribes. Sometimes it's to cheat, right? So sometimes it's like when you tell someone you know somebody, right? <laughs> that you really don't know at all, that you bumped into one time or you, or you, you snuck a creepy selfie in with, <laughs> you know, at some, at some grocery store and you say, yeah, I know that person, yeah, we're really cool, right? But this is your parents now. This isn't talking about a celebrity or something of that sort. It's falsely ascribing yourself to a tribe or to parents with the intention of trying to gain more in society and try to make it and so on and so forth. And that's something that the Prophet ﷺ saw as a great ingratitude and injustice to the parents. And it's deception and it's deceit and it's not something that should be done. And it was a real problem in their society for the Prophet ﷺ to have to have warned about it. Now, what about naming? What about ascribing yourself in another sense? So for example, how many of you have heard of Ibn Taymiyyah? You're going to hear a lot about him in the fifth part of this class, okay? Ibn Taymiyyah. What if I told you he's not Ibn Taymiyyah? Oh my God, he's not Ibn Taymiyyah. What is he? He's Taqiyya din Ahmad Ibn Abdul Halim Ibn 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 Taymiyyah. Meaning Taymiyyah is like 12 names up. But he's Ibn Taymiyyah. He's actually Taqiyya din Ahmad Ibn Abdul Halim. Ibn Taymiyyah al-Harrani. So Taymiyyah is way, way, way up. The same thing with al-Ghazali, the same thing with many of our ulama. So it's affirmed in our religion to ascribe yourself to someone higher up in your chain is something that's done. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to say, Ana Nabi la kadhib, I am the Prophet, I am not lying. Ana ibn Abdul Muttalib, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. But the Prophet ﷺ was the son of who? Abdullah. So when he says, I'm the son of Abdul Muttalib, He's not ascribing himself to a false lineage. That's the point. That's what the Prophet ﷺ was warning against. He's not falsely ascribing himself to someone that was not actually um, his. Now what about saying mom, dad, so on and so forth out of affection, out of love? You are my father, you are my mother, you are my this, you are my that. Is that something that's permissible? Yes or no? Who can give me a proof from a story I gave to you? Yes. Very good. Barakallah fiki. So Bashir ibn Aqraba, the Prophet ﷺ said, How would you like that I become your father and Aisha your mother? Numerous narrations of the Prophet ﷺ calling Al Abbas anhu, his walid, his father, to say something out of affection, to say something out of love, to say, Call me mom, call me dad. And they truly can call you mom, call you dad. You ascribe them to you in the sense of love and mawadda and that you will not be treated differently in this household. You are my son, you are my daughter, you are my mother, you are my father. All of that is permissible. What's not permissible is to lie about your lineage and ascribe yourself falsely to someone else. So that's where there's deceit involved and that's where it's not out of affection but it's actually trying to claim a lineage to another person and we can establish that from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now one of the main issues that comes up is the changing of the surname, the changing of the last name. Okay? Uh, again, one of the problems that we have is that, and this is actually, it's, when a scholar does it, it's not okay. When, when a person does it and they falsely match things together, it's, it's very, very problematic. To take the naming system, which is completely different from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and just equate it to our naming system that we have in America in the 21st century is deeply problematic. Why? Because it's an entirely different system. What the surname means, what the last name means here, is something completely different than what it meant there because in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was no such thing as a last name. There was no such thing as a surname. 
So you cannot say, based upon it being haram, to say, because Zayd ibn Muhammad was changed to Zayd ibn Haritha. He went back to being Zayd the son of Haritha. You cannot falsely, you cannot equate the last name in our culture, or the way that we name, to the ibn or the bint of so and so. Why? Number one, ascribing someone to someone else without indicating that they are the son of so and so and the daughter of so and so is permissible. I'll give you an example. Daraballahu mathalan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the example of Imra'at Fir'aun, Imra'at Nuh, right? The wife of so and so, the wife of so and so. There is an inscription there, but it's not claiming in any way or doing away with the lineage there. The woman is being ascribed to her husband um, in that sense. So what is, what is the naming system that's permissible? This is going to get really overly technical. I'm going to try to really summarize it. Number one, there are multiple names in Islam. There is Al-Ism, there is Al-Laqab, Wala Tanabazu Bil Al-Qab, there is Al-Kunya, which is Abu so-and-so, Um so-and-so. There is Anisba, which is ascribing yourself to a place or to an influential person that helps someone in your family or to a tribe or to a job. Where does surname fall in all of these different types of names? Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best, but it's actually like a nisbah. It, it falls like a nisbah. A nisbah can in sometimes in the sharia we find that it's done, or sometimes in, in culture it was done to describe a place that you live. So for example, al-Hijazi, al-Bukhari, al-Iraqi, so on and so forth. I don't want to say al-Baghdadi because we're not talking about that. There are good Baghdadis in the past as well, right? It's not just one al-Baghdadi, but al-Iraqi, al-Baghdadi, al-Yamani. This is a nisbah. You guys understand the concept? That's called a nisbah. It's a name which denotes, it's used at the end of a person's name to denote where that person came from. Sometimes it's to a tribe, al-Qurashi, al-Taymi, and so on and so forth, that you belong to this tribe. Sometimes it's to a dynasty, al-Ayubi, okay? For example, Salahuddin al-Ayubi. Sometimes it's to a rank, al-Muhajir, al-Ansari. Sometimes it's to a job, al-Najjar, right? Isa alayhi salam is al-Najjar. The point that I'm making is that a nisbah, which is the closest thing to a last name, existed as a form of ascription to something that that person was prominent for. Many times was the tribe, many times was the country, many times was the land. Therefore, you cannot say that the last name is equal to a patronym. A pat the patronymic system is the son of so-and-so, the daughter of so-and-so. The surname is really like a nisbah, it is not patronymic. But wait a minute, how does the lineage get preserved? It should still be preserved. Ideally, it's preserved actually through the middle name. Okay? You know, in some places in Europe, like in Russia and Ukraine, all right, they actually, it's actually legally binding that the middle name has to be the name of your father. Right? Or it was that case uh, for, some times, uh, for some time in history. Patronymics, patronyms, which are the son of so-and-so, the daughter of so-and-so, which is the Islamic system and what will be called upon on the Day of Judgment. Um, a lot of the names that we have, that we know. So for example, William's son literally means Ibn <laughs> William, right? And it became uh, William's son or Peterson. Literally comes from Ibn Peter, right? These are European systems and naming systems. Till now, we find that these naming systems are very, very complex. So it is okay and Allah knows best for a person. Or actually, Wilson is Ibn William, not William's son. Wilson, all right? Uh, it's okay for a person to change their last name, inshallah, so long as the lineage is preserved through some other way. Because you cannot make, you cannot equate the last name to the patronym that we have in our sharia. Ah. The lineage can be preserved elsewhere. It is a nisbah. The last name is a nisbah. It's just like al-Qurashi, al-Hijazi, al-Baghdadi, al-Taymi, whatever it may be. It is a nisbah. And Allah knows best. So as long as you preserve it through some other way, then it's fine insha'Allah ta'ala. The same is for example for marriage. It's okay to have that as your last name, but it's good to, for example, add a last name to your last name if you wanted to do that. If you wanted to have the same last name as your husband, it's okay. But still you should preserve your lineage. Because in this country, obviously, you change your middle name and your last name to your husband's. Right? So you become, you know, so-and-so. It's, it, it's actually kind of weird, right? But your middle name and your last name change to the first name and the last name of your husband. Okay, so you still have to find a way to preserve it, but if you wanted to make it legally e easier and you wanted to make it smoother in paperwork and just add the last name of your husband to the end of your name, Allah knows best, but it's permissible. A lot of scholars do hold that opinion. I hold that opinion that it's permissible, inshallah ta'ala, because it's simply a nisbah 
at that point. So there's nothing wrong with a, a, a son calling his father uh, or calling the, the, the foster care uh, father my dad or my mom or calling brother, sister. We obviously know brother, sister. We do it all the time. You know, we sound kind of awkward when we do it, but we do it all the time uh, for everybody. Um, so brother, sister, father, mother, also naming the child after you. So long as you try to preserve their biological uh, lineage, there's something else. Why? Because it's undue trauma on the child as well. The child goes to school with their brother and sister, and literally every single day they have to be reminded why they're different, which is not healthy. The other extreme of that is to not tell the child where they're from and what their lineage is, and to wait until they're 18, 19 years old, and they show up at Value Ranch Islamic Center at Sheikh Yasser's office or with me crying because they just found out they're adopted. Happens in the Muslim community too as well, by the way. So that's also something that's a problem. I actually have a quote from the American Society of Pediatrics. Uh, Adoption should not be a secret. Every youngster needs to have an honest understanding of his origin. Adopted children who have not been told seem to sense that somehow they are different. The nagging intuition can influence their self-image. The longer you wait, the harder it will be to discuss it with your child. Also, he is liable to find out from someone else, perhaps by overhearing the conversations of relatives or from teasing by neighborhood children who have learned from their own parents that he is adopted. Uh, it's narrated by healthychildren.org, Rawahu American Society of Pediatrics. There are a lot of these different, it's funny because I was reading it like a hadith and I realized that I was reading halfway through, I was like, it's not a hadith. But the point is, is that I'm not, I'm not speaking as a pediatrician here, as a psychiatrist, but it is something that our dean mandates that a child knows. They don't have to be reminded of it all the time. They don't have to be told that they're anything less. All the hadith that we've covered in the first session sort of clarify that they are indeed to be made to feel like they are just like all your other children. What they eat, what they drink, how they're treated, everything. So it's not a means of belittling them, but so that they have an honest conversation they know. However, you establish very early on, you're not going to be treated any differently. I love you just like I love my other children. You get that out of the way as early as possible. The longer you wait, the more you actually risk, again, violating hiflu nasal, which is the preservation of lineage, which is a part of our deen, and also the, the, the psychological well-being um, of that child uh, when they grow up. So it is important to establish that, inshallah ta'ala, without causing undue harm to the child. Islam always has a middle ground uh, between the two on these things. The issue of inheritance. <clears throat> Some of you may have, who have been following the Sahih al-Bukhari class, we actually went through the issue of inheritance and one of the things that we established in the issue of inheritance, contrary to what people think, the Prophet ﷺ, when he allowed one third of a person's inheritance to go to charity, he says, thuluthu wa thuluthu kathir. He says one third and one third is even really too much. Why? Because the most deserving of your inheritance are your children. So it's a Muslim idea that when I'm passing away, let me just dedicate everything to, to the hospital. It's not my money anymore. I'm dying anyway. I might as well turn it all into sadaqah. So let me turn it all into an orphanage or turn it all into a child. No, the Prophet says it's better it goes to your family with thuluthu kathir. And you have one third and that one third is even a lot. So where does it come with the orphan? The orphan does not naturally, the adopted child does not naturally inherit like the other children do, meaning they have to be factored in. However, the orphan can be, and there are precedent, there's a precedence for this from Ibn Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala, even that his entire one-third went to his orphans, okay, his adopted children. The orphan can actually end up with more than a biological child, but you work it out of that one-third, and again, what you spend upon that, that, that child is family and it's sadaqah as well, it's charity as well, it's a means of charity as well. This is constant sadaqah that you're doing. So it's important, inshallah, to operate within that one-third, you can determine that portion, it is very flexible, and that is the best. Because the Prophet ﷺ says that to give charity to a family member is sila and it's sadaqah. It's establishing the ties of kinship, and it's a form of charity. So that child that you've raised in your house, and you called, ma, you called your son, your daughter, you treat with love, inshaAllah ta'ala, you, you try to show them ihsan, you want to factor in something, inshaAllah ta'ala, within the inheritance that is just as much as the other children, if not more. But the sharia has flexibility. Um, in that regard. The third one which becomes a very complicated issue is the issue of mahram. How do, how, how do we deal with the awkwardness of a child not being mahram? To be honest with you, it is a great hindrance and unfortunately because of it many Muslims have shied away from it altogether. 
right? And I think that's probably the case for the majority is that this idea, well, how are they going to be mahram and how do we make that happen? Number one, if a child is breastfed by a woman within the first two years, that child becomes mahram to both parents and to everyone in the household, right? Just like blood, the Prophet ﷺ said the effect of milk is the effect of adam, it's the effect of blood. So that child becomes for all practical purposes just like any other child in the house. Okay? So rida'a establishes what the Prophet ﷺ said, it establishes uh, hurma, it establishes uh, someone to be forbidden in marriage, just like blood would establish. Uh, the amount of breastfeedings that would be required are five, five separate occasions. It used to be ten. Aisha radiallahu anha said that it was abrogated and it was reduced to five separate feedings. So you might find some hadiths would say ten or some books that say ten. It was a, an abrogated ruling. An initial ruling was that it was ten and it was abrogated to five, uh, which Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, which is in Sahih Muslim. So up to two years, if a person uh, you know, went through, you know, inshallah ta'ala, we actually, we have a sister who is a lactation nurse that could actually meet with sisters, talk to them inshallah ta'ala as well and kind of go over some things with everybody inshallah. But if a sister was to be able to feed a child on five separate occasions, that child does become mahram altogether. And there's no dispute in that regard. The dispute obviously becomes, or the issue becomes, what if the child is over two years old? Now within the madhahib, in fact in the Maliki madhahib and the Hanafi madhahib, a few months over two is usually disregarded. Okay, so if it's two years and a little bit more, it still falls within that hukum according to many of the scholars, where it still establishes that that child becomes mahram. Now, what happens to a child after the age of two? Uh, there is a very interesting story that took place with the Prophet Sallallahu which gives us, um, which gives us a discussion. Abu Hudayfa radiAllahu anhu was a close companion of the Prophet Sallallahu a beloved companion of the Prophet Sallallahu he and his wife Sahla radiallahu anha, they adopted a child by the name of Salim, Salim ibn Ma'qal. So Salim was adopted before the ruling on tabanni, before the ruling on forbidding that type of adoption, the full close adoption. He was brought into their house, they already had him. And then when the ruling came down, they were put in a very difficult situation. Why? Salim was over two years old, Kana Ghulam, he was a young young man, what young man here means like he was a child that was over two, some, he was not, you know, baligh yet, he was somewhere between puberty and being two years old, so it's a very long, wide range there. But the point is that he was too old to become a, a child, to become a mahram through breastfeeding. So Salim was in a difficult situation, Sahla, the mother, is in a difficult situation, Abu Hudayfa was in a difficult situation. They did not know what to do because he was, for all practical purposes, their son. And they did not know how to approach the situation. Sahla and Abu Hudayfa started to become uncomfortable with him, entering upon her without hijab and so on and so forth and hugging her because they didn't know what their situation was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now. Sahla went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that Salim enters upon us, he's, he's over the age of two, right? And Abu Hudayfa feels very uncomfortable, not because of jealousy, because obviously they raised him like a son, but because they were afraid they were violating the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What should we do? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, Ardi'ihi tahrumi alayhi wa yadhhab alladhi fi nafsi Abi Hudayfa. So he said to her, feed him and he will become mahram to you and that which is inside Abu Hudayfa will disappear. Now, some of you might remember there was a crazy fatwa that came out in, uh, from, actually, I'm not going to say the university, I get in trouble. I don't want to mar the university. There was a crazy fatwa that came out a few years ago that said if you're, getting, you know, you're having issues with your coworkers, we have to work together in the same office, it's okay. Just breastfeed the coworker and everything will be all right. And then suddenly he's going to be mahram to you. And it became a laughing stock in the, in the Arab world and throughout the Muslim world. And unfortunately, the Islamophobes really swallowed that up, right? That's actually, yeah, so <laughs> the, the point is they really use that against us and look at these crazy Muslims and that's what they're talking about and so on and so forth. What does this hadith mean? Ibn Hajar rahimahullah comments and he says, Al-Qadi Ayyad rahimahullah established, and this is something established by a Nawawi as well, that she did not expose herself to Salim, but rather she took her milk and she put it into a vessel. Salim drank from it through five days, so he, he drank from it five different times and Salim became mahram to her. So the issue is number one, 
there is no exposing to a child because that, that's against modesty and things of that sort in the first place, right? So there's a problem with that. So it was within a, a cup and it was within a vessel. Most of the ulama, the vast majority of the ulama say that this was a case, mahsus. It was specific to Salam. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ says that after two years the milk has no effect. So the vast majority of the scholars believed that this was a specific case, that the Prophet ﷺ made a specific rukhsa to Salam. I'm going to say that again, the vast majority of the scholars. It is the majority opinion that breast milk after two years has no effect. Uh, this is where we have an opinion that comes from Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Um, it also comes from, <clears throat> it's also ascribed to Ibn Qayyim, his student, um, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Sana'ani and Imam al-Shawkani. So there are a few scholars that held a separate opinion. The opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala was that in a normal situation, a child under two years old is the only one that can become mahram through breastfeeding. But if you have a four-year-old or a five-year-old and you have a situation where it's necessary, and the choices between throwing that child out on the street or taking them in as a mahram, then he said the case of Salim is precedent. So the case of Salim becomes precedence for that child, right? Uh, and actually Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he commented on that in the Zad. He said that Ibn Taymiyyah said that the hadith of Sahla is not makhsus, it's not specific, nor is it am, nor is it open. So it's not specific nor is it open, nor is it mansukh, nor is it abrogated, but rather it is muqayyad, it is restricted to a person that has a need, a haja, because the child is going to be entering frequently upon the mother and those types of things. So at that point, even if the child is older than two years old, the hukum would still apply. That's the fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah, and he actually ascribed it to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and to some others as well. He ascribed it to Alayth, the teacher of Imam Malik, Alayth ibn Sa'ad and others. So, in that situation, Ibn al-Qayyim particularly mentioned al-Laqit, which is the abandoned child, the child that was abandoned by the parents. So he said this is one of the hawa'ij, one of the, the necessities to wear kathratu dukhulihi ala nisa. That this young man, is go he's going to grow up and he's going to have to enter upon his mother, his, the mother who's taken him in, his sisters, the other girls in the house. So in that case, even after two years old, according to Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah rahimullah and Ibn al-Qayyim, and others, and this is something uh, in the very famous commentary on Bulugh al-Maram, a very classical textbook, which is Subul al-Salam by Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Sana'ani, and I know these are just really, really long names and things of that sort, I'm just rattling off to you, but there are other scholars that actually praised that opinion, and they said it's a good opinion because it, it combines between all of the evidences and it gets people out of a difficult situation. So if a person is in that difficult situation, it still becomes permissible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So even if a child is three, four, five years old, obviously if you want to stay on the safe side and whatever it is and, and accommodate the majority of the scholars, again, the vast majority of the scholars, then you try to look for a child that's under two. I'm going to leave that to Sister Sada to sort of talk about that if that's even an option. But if there's a case where that's not an option, if there's a case there's a very needy child, and the option is between leaving that child in a, in, in a situation where their Islam is going to be sacrificed, where their their care is going to be sacrificed and bringing that child in on the basis of a minor yet evidence-based opinion then you choose the minor yet evidence-based opinion to accommodate that child or you bring that child in and you accommodate them in a separate way where the mahram laws are not going to be um, abused and, and you'll find a way out for that child inshallah ta'ala but the point is there is wus'a there is expanse in this masala, in this question there are ways around the, diff the difficult situations that we have um, and in that situation, inshallah ta'ala, it becomes okay. And usually when, 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 Ibn, when Imam bin Taymiyyah rahimahullah gives an opinion, this is maybe just a fiqhi tangent, but when he gives an opinion that's not really the, the norm, um, a lot of people will criticize him for that opinion, yet they'll adopt it in their own lives. So for example, Ibn Taymiyyah has the, has the famous opinion that three talaqs in one sitting, the triple talaq in one sitting, does not lead to uh, three talaqs, but rather it counts as one. He held that opinion. It's definitely a very minor opinion. And you know what? The, the, the uh, Mufti, the, the, the Diyar al Fatawa in, in Egypt, though they reject the opinion, they apply it because it gets people out of a difficult situation. So there's haraj in this situation. There's a very difficult situation that we're facing with. We're not in a society where a woman that's a widow will easily remarry 
or a woman with children will easily remar remarry and these children will be taken care of. We have very difficult situations that we need to deal with insha'Allah ta'ala. So again, adopting an opinion that's not a majority opinion, but it's evidence-based is okay in this situation insha'Allah ta'ala to get ourselves out of that difficulty. And again, as you can see on all of these different masail, on all of these different issues, there are ways to provide a normal upbringing without violating any aspect of your faith insha'Allah ta'ala while still receiving all of the rewards. We ask Allah to grant us the murafaqah, uh, the companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu in Jannat al-Firdaus and to enable us insha'Allah ta'ala to, uh, to fulfill the sunnah as a community, to revive the sunnah. I really hope that this lecture, uh, maybe, maybe it's, it's being too idealistic, but I hope it's a game changer in our community in some ways. I really do hope insha'Allah some people will rise to the occasion insha'Allah and we, we do have Sister Sara Haider from New Star Kafada Agency now insha'Allah who will go over the practical aspects insha'Allah ta'ala. So how we can actually move forward with an adoption agency insha'Allah ta'ala if we wanted to take that. So Jazakumullah khair, I'm going to hand it over to her and then afterwards insha'Allah ta'ala uh, we'll, we'll move to questions for the rest of the, the evening.